Uh, melhor você deixar algumas acesas aqui, porque a plateia pode aparecer no... Isso, esse está ótimo. Ok, é, estamos já gravando, né? Então, bem-vindo a todos que estão nos assistindo pelo Zoom, pelo YouTube e até mesmo aqui presencialmente. É, estamos todos dispersos, mas todos juntos aqui. E é um grande prazer hoje apresentar o colóquio é, desta semana, que é uma iniciativa da Comissão de Pesquisa junto com a Comissão de Pós-Graduação, e eu vou falar algumas palavras sobre o professor Neil Turok, que está esperando que vai dar aqui o, a palestra para a gente. Hi, Neil. I'm just presenting Hi. you here in Portuguese. Hi. O Neil fala um pouquinho de português, muito pouquinho. <risos> Mas deixa eu falar uma introdução breve para vocês. O Neil fez a sua graduação em Cambridge, depois fez o doutorado uh, no Imperial College na Inglaterra e depois foi trabalhar trabalhou sua vida inteira em algumas das questões mais fundamentais de física, de, é, de cosmologia também, e é uma das pessoas que tem uma das uh, cabeças mais inovadoras aí na área de física teórica, e teve um bate-papo super legal com os estudantes agora há pouco, é, deu um monte de dicas interessantes, é, compartilhou experiências de vida que foram muito legais. So, Neil, I was just making a general introduction and, and saying how nice it was to, to have that chat earlier with you. Uh, thank so, you. Uh, I already introduced you to the to the audience. So okay. now you have the word, and we are very happy to have you. So Neil Turok, everybody, thanks. Thank you, Raul. Uh, great pleasure to join you all. I uh, wish I could be there in person, um, but and hopefully will be in the not too distant future. Uh, yeah, I just had a lovely chat with your students. Lots of good questions about uh, why do physics and, and so on. Uh, so at least that was a little bit of the social side of this kind of event. Um, I'm going to talk about um, a theory of the universe, but let me um, first of all tell you this is very much still in development. Uh, it's a series of new approaches to uh, big problems in cosmology. But I've given myself this rather grandiose title uh, in order to emphasize the importance of actually having a theory. Um, and as you'll see, that's something I, I feel the, the field of fundamental theoretical physics has uh, not so far focused enough attention on. So uh, this work is based on uh, a couple, uh, some papers, uh, first ones in uh, First one in 2018, um, and uh, this is more related to the origin of the explanation of the dark matter, which I will also only mention briefly. But then uh, very recently, in the last few months, we've had uh, several papers come out, uh, so far just as preprints, uh, many more in the, in the works. And so you're uh, learning about this theory very much during the time of its uh, first emergence. <clears throat> so let me just begin with a perspective on the field of theoretical physics, uh, fundamental theoretical physics and where it is at the moment. Um, I have uh, participated very actively in this field uh, throughout my career as a physicist, but I think only relatively recently uh, over the last 10 years, I began to um, question some fundamental assumptions in the field. I've always been somewhat critical of uh, the mainstream approaches, but this has really come to a head. And uh, so let me just say at the beginning that I'm not in the majority in the field. Um, I, I'm uh, very much trying to create an alternative to the mainstream. Um, and, and so I just have to begin by being completely upfront that um, I don't go along with the most popular picture of the universe. Uh, to me, it's just astonishing that it is popular, but it is. Uh, there's been a sort of um, uh, merger of inflationary theory and superstring theory, which has led to this picture of the inflationary multiverse 
um, which is probably the least predictive theory uh, ever to emerge from science. Uh, the basic idea is that the universe consists of lots of different bubble universes, uh, everyone different, and uh, the laws within those physics, those different universes are different. The universe on large scales looks extremely chaotic and random, and uh, there are no predictions. Uh, this, this picture, which has emerged and become surprisingly popular to me, um, has, uh, has really um, dominated uh, a lot of the discussion. Um, and it has been advocated mainly on the basis that there is no alternative, right? That somehow superstring theory never fulfilled the hopes of predicting anything, predicting the known laws. Instead, it just produced this multitude of possible string compactifications. And then secondly, that inflation, the whole idea behind inflation is that the universe is fundamentally wild and chaotic. And only in certain special places does it get inflated and smoothed out and uh, turned into a universe like the one we see. So we live in a, a sort of unusual part of the universe, which is well organized and so on. But the fundamental justification for both of these views is that um, there is no simple explanation for the basic laws of nature and the basic structure of the universe. And that's what I want to question. So in my view, this inflationary multiverse is a dead end. Uh, I don't think it's going to lead to further progress. I have thought that for a long time and it has not. And so far that view has been confirmed. I just say that's my humble opinion. Um, and uh, many people working in the field would, uh, would disagree with that. My own philosophy, um, which will sound extremely conservative, um, uh, is, is one of minimalism and humility before the data. I think we need to listen when the universe tell, tells us something, uh, something um, you know, profound about itself. And I think when we build theories, we've got to be careful not to build um, you know, castles in the air. So very obvious things, we should be very reluctant to add new ingredients to our theories. Uh, now, in fact, the record of cosmology for the last uh, 40 years is essentially adding new ingredients. That's what we've been doing for a long time. It was grand unified theories, uh, supersymmetric theories, inflationary models, extra dimensions, membranes, uh, M theory. Uh, it all became more and more involved and arbitrary and, uh, uh, and the number of predictions of course uh, decreased as that happened. Secondly, we should do our best to form testable hypotheses. It's a very old idea due to Popper, and uh, who said that a hypothesis is only really interesting if it can be proven wrong. And, uh, and I, I'm still a firm believer in, uh, in that. And finally, we need to be guided by the observations um, and move away from inventing scenarios. Uh, the first paper on inflation was called an inflationary universe scenario. And I'm afraid that encouraged many people, including myself, to write lots of papers on different scenarios. But I, I think we need to talk about theories, uh, not scenarios. The difference between the two is a, a theory is something which is definite enough that it makes clear predictions uh, and can be proven wrong. Now, uh, one of my heroes is this man, John Wheeler. I was Richard Feynman's uh, PhD advisor, and I was very lucky to know him personally at Princeton. And he had a beautiful way with words. And here's a quote from him. Uh, Behind it all is surely an idea so simple, so beautiful, that when we see it in a decade, a century, or a millennium, and I love the time scale involved, we will all say to each other, how could it have been otherwise? How could we have been so stupid? And so indeed, this is what motivates me is that I think uh, 
the observations have revealed the universe to be remarkably simple and beautiful. And we, our theories do not possess the same simplicity and beauty. And we should be encouraged by that to look for theories which are simpler and, and more beautiful. So the age of modern cosmology really began with this satellite uh, in 1992. And again, I was very lucky to actually be in Princeton when this data was first revealed. And it's quite astonishing that you measure the spectrum of radiation coming to us from the sky. Uh, that's the red crosses. And the green curve is the Planck spectrum, which is the most fundamental spectrum of in, uh, in quantum physics. And of course, it's the, the reason Planck invented quantization. And you see how well it fits. So the microwave sky, if this had been measured before Planck invented quantum mechanics or quantization of photons, the microwave sky would be telling us this is, this is the way the universe works. Quantum mechanics operates on very large scales. And uh, so this wonderful success of COBE, this uh, very precise measurement of the spectrum of the microwave radiation, was the first indication of the extraordinary simplicity and precision uh, of, uh, of, of the cosmos in, in, uh, in satisfying these very basic physical laws. Now, uh, of course, things have moved on. This is the picture of the, of the microwave sky in much more detail made by the Planck satellite. And again, I like to think of, uh, you know, in the Middle Ages, did people ever imagine we would make a picture of the whole universe? Um, and so here's a quote from Romeo and Juliet, uh, that vast shore washed with the farthest sea. And that's, that's what we're seeing. We're literally seeing uh, the very early universe as it came out of the Big Bang. And we're seeing the primordial uh, fluctuations across the sky. So we're an extremely privileged generation to see this. And I think we, we really have to learn from it. Um, Jim Peebles uh, recently won the Nobel Prize for many contributions to cosmology, um, which, which really collectively form the basis of our standard understanding of, um, of these observations. And one of these was his calculations uh, in, the, in 1970 of the um, anisotropies in the micro background, the power spectrum anisotropies. And in particular, they quantified these bumps in the power spectrum, which are really an ex a, a very simple physical phenomenon of just acoustic waves oscillating in this hot plasma in the early universe. And these acoustic waves are on vast uh, length scales, but they still evolve just like ordinary sound waves. And uh, that's the, their oscillations translate into this, these bumps in the picture. So the confirmation of calculations by Peebles and others really gives us confidence that we know a lot about the universe as it emerged from the Big Bang. I was lucky to get into this field in uh, uh, in the 90s, when not everything had been calculated. And so here uh, is a calculation of the correlation between the polarization of the, that, that's misspelled, it should be polarization, and the temperature of the micro background. The two are correlated because the same density perturbations are what cause both the temperature anisotropy and the polarization. So the red curve is our theoretical prediction from the mid nineties and the blue dots are the data. And the amazing thing here is that there are no free parameters in this prediction. Uh, you fix all the free parameters in the cosmology to this curve, and then you simply predict this curve and, and the data lies on top of it. So I show this to you just as an example of how precise cosmology has become and uh, and how remarkable it is that the laws of physics we first learned here on Earth, uh, the, the laws learned uh, used here are basically general relativity plus uh, plasma physics, as worked out by Chandrasekhar, 
And those were all worked out in the 20s before people even knew that there was um, a universe to look at. Um, people even didn't even know that there was more than there were more than one galaxy, uh, let alone a universe. And, and nevertheless, the laws that were these people wrote down translated into predictions which are amazingly precise. Here's the very latest data. You see lots and lots of uh, these bumps now. And so uh, each one, they give us uh, more and more confidence that we really understand how the universe came out of the Big Bang. Now this slide summarizes uh, what we see um, in, in, the, in the picture. You see the solar system, there's a logarithmic scale of distance. So the solar, solar system is here. And then as we go outwards, we're looking back in time towards the Big Bang. The red circle is the circle of um, last scattering of the photons, when the, uh, the, the light you saw in the previous picture was released from the hot plasma and just traveled uh, through space to us. And as we go further out still, we're in the very hot Big Bang in this thin shell, and then the blue circle is the Big Bang singularity itself. So we, we can see most of the way to the singularity, but not, uh, not the whole way. Uh, there's an amazingly simple fit to all the observations we have, and we have many more, the distribution of galaxies and, uh, uh, and, and, and all of its clustering, all of their clustering properties. Um, and there's an amazingly simple fit to all of these data. It requires just five numbers, um, which so far we treat as free parameters. Uh, three of them describe the energy content. That's how many baryons there are per, nu per photon, baryon just being a, a neutron or a proton. Uh, the density in dark matter compared to the density in baryons, which is about a factor of five. Um, and then the density in the dark energy or cosmological constant. So there are three basic parameters that describe the energy content. And then there are two parameters that describe the geometry of the universe. The way we talk about that is by uh, specifying the curvature of space. So in the first approximation, space is not curved. It's flat Euclidean space. That's a puzzle because Einstein's theory of gravity allows space to be curved, but nevertheless, the universe is amazingly flat. Uh, and then this curvature, the Ricci three curvature of the spatial slices of fixed uh, density, um, if I multiply it by k to the minus two, you remember the Ricci curvature is basically gradient squared. So k to the minus two will cancel the gradient squared. This you can think of as a dimensionless potential, a bit like a Newtonian potential. And um, the distribution of um, Fourier modes in that potential is almost perfectly scale invariant, meaning that there's the same amplitude, AK, um, on all scales with a slight uh, red tilt, but it's only something like one and a half percent. So, and this amplitude is essentially 10 to the minus four. So you can think of the, the density variations in the universe, the ones, the variations that came out of the Big Bang as consisting on, of uh, random waves with a power spectrum that, such that the amplitudes are almost the same on all scales. It's incredibly simple. Um, and, and, and because this number is rather small, you could, you could really say that to a very good approximation, we can describe everything we see in the universe with four numbers. Um, many quantities are uh, consistent with zero. So what we've learned is that the universe is incredibly simple on large scales. Now, the fundamental laws of physics are also rather simple uh, and amazingly unified as we know them already. And so this equation represents all of the known physical laws. Um, here's gravity, Einstein's theory of gravity. These are gauge theories, the strong, weak, and electromagnetic interactions, they all operate on a similar principle. The particles, 
the electrons and uh, muons, taons, the quarks, and then the Higgs uh, field, which couples to, to all of them, contributes to their masses, and uh, the energy density in the Higgs field um, contributes to the dark energy uh, in, in the universe or the cosmological constant. So here are all the laws, and you'll notice that I've written them as a path integral. Um, this is the most elegant formulation of the laws that we know. It says that any amplitude for a physical process is given by adding up this phase factor. Okay, the known laws of physics simply come into the phase of, uh, of a phase factor, e to the i theta, and you just add up all those phases, and, uh, and that gives you the amplitude. It's actually remarkable that all the laws can be put into this form. Uh, the formula itself looks complicated, but in fact, these are the only ways, the only way we know of, of quantizing particles of spin two, one, half, and zero, uh, which, which are the particles we know of in the standard model. And so one could actually replace the formula by just saying, that the world consists of uh, particles of spin two, spin one, spin half, and spin zero. Uh, and, and here are the particles. There are quarks, there are leptons, there are these forces, SU3 cross SU2 cross U1. The Higgs boson is, is coupling to all of these. Um, and then, uh, and, and gravity of co course couples to everyone. But we also have evidence for right-handed neutrinos. These are a little bit mysterious because they don't uh, couple directly to uh, any of these uh, gauge uh, forces in nature. Uh, they're neutral or sterile particles, um, but we have evidence that they exist from the fact that we see the left-handed neutrinos to have uh, small masses. So, the only, the, the only particles we have evidence for are those uh, included in this picture. Now, the way the right-handed neutrinos contribute to the left-handed neutrinos masses is through something called the seesaw mechanism, which is a very beautiful thing, which is that the left-handed neutrino can couple to a right-handed neutrino and the Higgs uh, boson through a, a vertex, just H nu L nu, nu R. And so this means that if a left-handed neutrino is traveling along, it can change into a virtual right-handed neutrino for a brief instant of time. This is a very heavy particle, but you can change into it briefly and then change back into a left-handed neutrino. And it's this process of mixing uh, with the virtual very massive particle, which gives the left-handed neutrinos a very tiny mass. And so intuitively, you can see that if this intermediate particle is extremely heavy, this mixing is not going to happen. The left-handed neutrino simply won't, uh, or will only very rarely mix with it. And so it will require a very small mass. Um, so the, 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 the seesaw, it's, that's why it's called the seesaw mechanism, because the heavier the right-handed neutrino is, the lighter the mass of the left-handed neutrino. So we believe this exists, and, uh, and that is the reason why we believe that all of these uh, particles, including the right-handed neutrinos, exist. Now, I, I, I mention this because uh, one of the most famous pieces of evidence for physics beyond this uh, standard model is that there is dark matter. Uh, we observe dark matter in cosmology, and there are lots of experiments designed to look for it. But it turned out that there was a simple solution of the dark matter problem staring us all in the face, which is that the dark matter is one of these right-handed uh, neutrinos. And I'll say a little bit more about that later. But uh, it was only by thinking about the Big Bang more carefully that we realized that we could actually understand how one of the three right-handed neutrinos, one of these particles, could be the cosmological dark matter. And if so, it makes very precise predictions 
about the properties of the left-handed neutrinos, and these can be checked in uh, experiments, and they will be checked over the next 10 years. So um, I'll say a little bit more about that later. But back to the philosophy I want to pursue, what I've become interested in is really re-examining these physical laws, the law we know, the laws we know, to see if we can find simple and testable solutions to fundamental questions, right? That sounds so obvious, you know, why isn't everyone doing that? Well, the reason people aren't doing it is because it's hard. That, um, you know, one <clears throat> very uh, uh, talked about issue is the, for example, the ultraviolet divergences in gravity. <clears throat> that gravity is not a renormalizable theory. And so um, uh, one finds infinities in perturbation theory. And it's a sort of awkward business to have to cancel them at every order. But <clears throat> in fact, that feature of gravity may be, may be a virtue because um, uh, you know, if, you, if you have an ultraviolet divergence, you concentrate energy in a small region of space well, the obvious thing that gravity will do is form a black hole, and that will essentially um, remove the, those uh, high energy uh, uh, particles from propagating in loops. So it seems that this, this feature of gravity may be responsible for actually taking care of the ultraviolet divergences. The only problem is that we don't have the calculational techniques to understand um, how to do non-perturbative calculations using gravity. So uh, this is one of the ways, that's a very, very hard problem, but it's one of the ways in which there, there, there are indications that the laws I've written down may be it. You know, they may be a consistent and complete set of laws. And actually our job is to understand those laws and how they work rather than postulating new particles, dimensions, uh, symmetries, scenarios, Okay, maybe our job is just to understand, you know, what we already know is there. Now, one of the most interesting things uh, I realized uh, thinking about this formula is that what it's telling us is that uh, all dynamical processes in physics, and that without exception, are really a consequence of interference. You see, there's an I in this formula. And as I said, any amplitude is just a sum of phases. And so all we really have to do as theoretical physicists is understand how to calculate interference patterns. Um, and that's what's going on. That's what quantum physics is. It's just uh, interference. This point of view is actually emphasized by Feynman. He, he, he said that, that there's really only one puzzle about quantum physics, which is that, which is interference. And, um, and why you calculate probabilities uh, by squaring interference amplitudes. Um, so this is an absolutely universal principle. And it's rather beautiful that all, the, all of our laws in the standard model can be put in this form. But as soon as you realize this, you naturally ask the question, does this formula make any sense? If I think about it as a gigantic integral, it's an extremely oscillatory integral, right? So you, you, you might have tried to do the integral e to the i x squared uh, and wondered about that. It's called a Fresnel integral. It's very oscillatory. As x gets large, the phase changes more and more rapidly. But, uh, but, but that's nothing compared to this theory. Uh, this is extremely oscillatory. And of course, it's an infinite dimensional integral. And so there are real question marks about whether this integral exists. Does it make any sense? Um, and so that's a question I've been asking a lot in the last few years. And uh, we are gradually developing answers to that question. Turns out that question hasn't really been asked much in the past. It's rather strange. The, the, the trick that was invented in the 50s to deal with um, uh, path integrals, even in quantum mechanics, was to rotate time to imaginary values. Uh, that's called the Wick rotation. And so you just remove the eye by rotating time. You, you say that the, the, the 
the time coordinate is not real, it's imaginary. And that turns out to replace this essentially with a minus sign. And then you ended up, you end up doing statistical physics in Euclidean time. And you hope you can recover the Lorenzi, the real-time physics by analytic continuation back. And that's been the foundation of quantum field theory for uh, for decades. But uh, but it's it's questionable very questionable, especially because it doesn't work at all for gravity. Uh, there is no Euclidean path integral for gravity, uh, whereas the real time or Lorentzian integral seems to exist um, fine. So we have a new paper on this coming out soon, and I just want to advertise this as, as a kind of obvious conceptual issue which has never been properly addressed. That's an opportunity. We, we can address it now. And uh, there are actually new techniques for doing that. Now, our goal is actually to do gravity this way. And uh, this is based on a very old, and when you look at it, very obvious idea that the way you should do quantum gravity is by talking about quantum geometrodynamics. What does that mean? Well, Einstein's theory of gravity says that space-time is a manifold which can be curved. And so the amplitude you want to consider is to take some initial three geometry, some curved space like a sphere or, or some other, or a torus or something. And uh, you, you take some initial geometry, perhaps with, uh, with uh, disturbances on it, and you have a final geometry, and then you do a path integral, just like the one I wrote down, where you sum over all intermediate four geometries, all four geometries with these two, three geometries as their boundary. So Wheeler proposed that this is the natural formulation of how to quantize gravity, and it still is. It's very appealing, but nobody has developed the methods to actually calculate this, uh, certainly not in, uh, in real time, as, as I've emphasized. So that's all to do, and I think it can be done, and, and um, will be exciting to do it. But the main point is we there's no reason to think this doesn't work. This may well work. And this may be what quantum gravity is. It's the most plausible answer anybody has, has given so far. Now, I'm going to get more specific and talk about uh, the large scale puzzles about the universe. In particular, why is the universe so flat? Why does it have this ridiculously simple geometry when it could have, uh, seemingly could have been very curved and very wild uh, on large scales? And Einstein's theory of gravity doesn't answer that question. This is the way Roger Penrose puts it. He imagines the creator you know, choosing the geometry of the universe, whatever came out of the Big Bang. And somehow the creator chose this extremely special an unusual geometry, namely almost perfectly flat and then uh, homogeneous and isotropic on, on large scales. So uh, thinking about the path integral for gravity uh, led us to re-examine this question. And of course, the same issue was the motivation for inflation. Inflation argued, uh, inflationary theory proposes, or the scenario of inflation, proposes that there was a phase of exponential expansion where the universe blew up and became flat and smooth and homogeneous due to some extra ingredient, which is, which is added. So let's draw a parallel in, in attempting to address this question of the geometry of the universe. Let's draw a parallel with something much nearer to home. Let's just talk about the Earth. And so this is where I live, near Edinburgh. And you know, if we only explored a small uh, part of the universe, as you walk from home to work or whatever, and you only go over a short distance, then the surface of the Earth appears quite flat. Um, uh, and you know, early people certainly weren't aware that the Earth was a sphere. They were only aware of a small region of it, and so they thought they thought, uh, I mean, from what they saw, it was flat. Uh, by the way, this is an actual picture from space taken by NASA, and you see the extraordinary smoothness and roundness 
of the earth. Now, one explanation for why the earth is so beautifully round and smooth would be that that's the way it was made, or there was a maker, uh, in this, or maybe a mechanism, and the, whoever made the earth sort of hammered it into this perfectly uh, smooth shape. This is a little bit like the inflationary uh, theory. You've got to add something which produces the effect you want. But there's a much better explanation for why the earth is is locally flat. First point is that it's large. It has about 10 to the 50 atoms. Um, secondly, gravity pulls the matter inwards. Um, and so uh, uh, gravity will, of course, try to cause uh, mountains to collapse. And when they collapse, they don't rebound because of dissipation. So the combination of gravity pulling everything inwards and dissipation, keeping it in when it's fallen, like when you drop a stone, it, it stays down. Gravity and dissipation favors the, uh, the Earth becoming progressively more and more round. Well, ultimately, this explanation has to do with thermodynamics. There's just, there are many more states for a given amount of energy to be distributed as, as heat of the atoms making up the earth, then there are in, uh, if one distributed that uh, energy in mountains or spikes on the earth and created a more random geometry. So entropy favors the earth becoming round and smooth. And indeed that's, that's what it became. So that's a, an excellent explanation. And in fact, there is recent evidence in favor of this, uh, uh, which is quite cute, which is that if you ask where are all the big mountain ranges on the earth, um, it turns out that the large mountain ranges uh, were formed just after the explosion of life on, on earth, that when the, the first living things to form were in the oceans, and when, for example, plankton formed in the ocean and absorbed the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, that plankton settled to the bottom of the oceans and it was full of carbon. And so eventually it sedimented into layers of graphite. And graphite is an excellent lubricant. And so when the continental plates on the surface of the earth collided, uh, they were now lubricated. And so one plate could slide above another. And that's how the first mountains, uh, the, the very high mountains formed. So this re very recent work, uh, just last year, studied a whole number of mountain ranges around the globe. And they found that in every case, when they looked at these very large um, uh, mountain ranges, they, that was correlated with a layer of graphite. And so what that's saying is that when you remove the dissipation, then actually that helps you form wilder, more jagged geometries. So that's just sort of cute side issue. But, uh, but the reason the earth is big, it, it is, is uh, flat and smooth is because of gravity and dissipation. Now let's, uh, let's go to cosmology. Um, and in cosmology, we want to calculate um, the typical states of a universe. You know, if we want to ask a question like, why is the universe, why does it take the form that it does? You need to have some sort of measure on the possible geometries of the universe. Uh, in the case of the earth being round, we do have a measure. We have statistical mechanics. We can, we can uh, use it to calculate which shapes of the earth are more likely and which are less likely. Gravitational entropy is, is, a, is a more tricky subject, um, but uh, has been developed in particular to address black holes um, and, and black hole thermodynamics. And this is the work of Hawking and uh, all the, and Bekenstein and the subsequent investigators which has gradually led to a picture, led to a picture which is somewhat uh, consistent um, about what are the thermodynamics of, uh, what, what is the thermodynamics of space time? Because essentially that's what uh, black hole thermodynamics is. So as you know, there's a Hawking temperature 
Uh, I'm just giving things in, uh, in units, in Planck units here. Hawking temperature is inversely proportional to the mass of the black hole. So a huge black hole is uh, very cold. And the entropy of a black hole depends on its area, and that goes like the mass squared. So a big black hole has a huge amount of entropy. And that's saying there are many, many states which, which go along with that. And I should say this subject is still not completely conclusive. People still argue about it. I still wonder about what this entropy really means. Where are the microstates? But um, there is a fair amount of evidence by now that, that this, uh, this is the way that uh, black holes uh, work. Now, a development of that was the entropy of de Sitter space. Uh, de Sitter space is a very crude approximation to today's universe, because in de Sitter space, you have a cosmological constant or dark energy, and you have nothing else. And when you then solve the Einstein equations, you find this structure. So as time goes up, it, it uh, bounces. De Sitter space contracts exponentially, and then it grows exponentially. And, uh, and, um, and so this is what the universe would be like if there was no matter and no radiation, if there was only a lambda. The entropy of de Sitter space can be calculated in the same way as the black hole entropy is calculated. And you find it is huge with today's value of the dark energy density or cosmological constant. It's 3.26 times 10 to the 122. And if you think, you know, what are the number of states of the universe? That's the exponential of the entropy. That's a truly uh, astronomical number. Um, the way the calculation was done was using the path integral. Okay, again, the path integral is fundamental. Um, and Hawking was a sort of master of how to use it to extract uh, physical quantities. And so I won't go through the calculation, but essentially you just take the, the exponent in that phase factor and you ask, what would this be for the simplest geometry corresponding to a cosmological constant? And if time is Euclidean, which, you, which happens because of the wick rotation to get rid of the phase, then um, uh, you have a Euclidean geometry, meaning the signature is plus, 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 then there's an obvious solution of the Einstein equations, which is a four sphere. And you can uh, work out its Ricci scalar and use that to calculate the action. And uh, this gives you the entropy, uh, uh, this formula for the entropy, which I gave above. So that is basically the state of the art of calculating the uh, entropy for black holes in de Sitter space time. There's some generalizations to spinning black holes and so on, but uh, uh, all of this is very similar in spirit. The new twist, okay, and this again comes about just by trying to think about this a little more, uh, in a little more detail, a little more carefully. The new twist in our, in our work has been to say, well, let's include radiation because the big bang, we, we know the universe is full of radiation. So let's start by taking the usual assumption of a homogeneous isotropic universe with some curvature, can be positive, negative, or zero. And uh, we have a scale factor for the size of the universe. And so this is the line element. Then we have a, as density in the universe, the first approximation, let's say we only have radiation and lambda, the radiation dominates at early times, uh, because its density goes like one over a to the fourth, the lambda dominates at late times. When a gets very large, it's, it's lambda. So we're interested in universes which look approximately like ours, which go from a period of radiation domination near the Big Bang to a period of lambda domination in the far future. And uh, so here's the Friedman equation. It's really not that uh, complicated. Uh, this is including space curvature. And I should say for kappa positive, I'm assuming a sphere. For kappa negative, I'm assuming compact subspace of a three hyperboloid, uh, just in order to keep everything finite. And so there are, uh, one can compactify an open universe, so-called into a compact finite space. And that's what I, I'll assume. 
um, it, it, the actual compactification turns out not to be very important. They all behave roughly the same way. Um, okay, so it turns out the solution of this equation is a rather nice function. And uh, strangely enough, before our work, this wasn't really appreciated. Maybe people found the solution, but somehow they didn't connect it to path integrals and to Euclidean actions and entropy. And so we did this rather trivial thing, which is to take a sort of obvious cosmology, find the analytic solution. It's a Jacobi elliptic function. It's just a generalization of a sign, a trigonometric function. Um, and uh, with, with these precise uh, parameters, um, and then stare at this for a long time and see what does this mean? Well, this is what the solutions look like and they have some amazing properties. So in particular, the fact that the radiation is conformal invariant, and that means that if you change um, the length scale, the equations governing the radiation are invariant. Okay, this is a basic property of Maxwell's equations. It's why an X-ray is the same as a radio wave, the same as a light wave. They're all just rescalings of one another. So when the, because of that conformal invariance properties, it turns out that if the radiation dominates at the Big Bang, then the scale factor has a simple zero, meaning that A of T vanishes linearly in T. There's no branch cut, there's no complicated power law, uh, it, it's a simple zero. So the Big Bang is a simple zero of the scale factor that's due to the conformal invariance of the radiation. Secondly, you can ask when the scale factor blows up due to the lambda, what kind of blow up is it? And it turns out it's a simple pole that A of T goes like one over T. Um, and so the two sort of simplest zeros and poles are, uh, occur in this, uh, in this cosmology. Um, and so you might guess from this that this A of T function might have some very special complex analytic properties. You know, it's got a simple zero and it's got a simple pole. And it turns out that actually this function A of T is single valued in the entire complex T plane. And uh, I've written it as a function of T, but if, if you notice, I also include an N here. Um, N is known as the lapse in general relativity. And it's useful, even though you can choose coordinates in which n equals one, it's useful to leave n in there and to sort of treat this t coordinate as a label, a non-dynamical label, and we'll never touch it. But if we want to rotate to Euclidean time, for example, we instead rotate n. n is a dynamical variable in gravity. It's called the lapse. Uh, you can choose coordinates to remove it, but it's actually often very useful to leave it. And one of those situations is when uh, you want to go to Euclidean time. So obviously if this little n became, if I change it to uh, i times capital N with capital N real, then that will give me a plus sign here um, in front of this uh, dt squared term. And so, and I'll have a Euclidean metric. Okay, so that's the wick rotation done using this variable n. So we can regard this, uh, this a, it really is a function of nt. And so rather than rotate time, it's, it's technically nicer to rotate n. So it turns out this elliptic function is single valued in the entire complex n plane. It's only singularities for simple poles. And it is furthermore, it is doubly periodic. So here is a sort of picture of it the real part of NT, the imaginary part of NT. Um, this would, the, the blue crosses are zeros of uh, the scale factor uh, in, in the complex plane. And the uh, white peaks are poles. And so you can imagine a universe sort of going from a singularity through a zero that's through a big bang to a future um, De Sitter-like singularity. Or you could go up in imaginary time and you'd find the same thing. 
And the function turns out to be doubly periodic. It's periodic both in the real and the imaginary parts of the argument. Now, why is this interesting? Uh, why is it, it, it's not just mathematics because periodicity in imaginary time implies there's a temperature. And in fact, this is exactly how Hawking worked out the temperature of a black hole is by noting that the Euclidean metric is periodic, periodic in imaginary time. And the same for de Sitter space. We saw the sphere. The sphere is obviously periodic and that gives a de Sitter temperature. So what we've realized is that when I include radiation in this uh, cosmology, I still have a Hawking temperature. It's not the same as the temperature of the radiation. This, is, this Hawking temperature is more a property of the lambda, uh, the, the cosmological constant. So, so in this cosmology, we've actually got two temperatures. One is the radiation temperature and the other is the Hawking temperature. But nevertheless, we can uh, still do uh, statistical mechanics with, uh, with that. Now, um, so this understanding this analytic structure of the metric led us to the following picture. We realized that, okay, here's the Big Bang. The scale factor goes linearly with T. That means I can follow the space through the Big Bang in a unique manner. So the metric is analytic in T. I just follow it through and I come out the other side with another Big Bang. Now, what that really means is that I can then implement a symmetry under T goes to minus T. The space time is symmetric. And we realized this, this uh, so this is what we realized in 2018. This means that the universe does not have to break CPT symmetry. CPT is the most fundamental symmetry we know. You, you, um, you take a given configuration of, uh, of the universe, of all the particles, you charge conjugate them, so replace a particle by its antiparticle. You do the parity operation, inverting space uh, through the origin, and then you reverse time. And under all three, the, the combination of all three uh, symmetry operations, the laws of physics are invariant. But the paradox was that the universe is not, right? The universe is not time symmetric uh, if it comes out of a Big Bang. Uh, it's going one way, it's expanding one way. And uh, likewise, it's not invariant under C and CP because we have matter and no more matter than antimatter. So if we switch particles to antiparticles, the universe clearly changes. So what we realized is that if we extend the universe through the Big Bang, we can restore CPT symmetry to the universe. And we can say the universe does not break CPT symmetry. So that became a fundamental principle. Let's assume that is the case, in which case the Big Bang is just a conformal zero. It is a zero in the conformal factor of space-time. So if matter in the universe is conformally invariant as electromagnetism is, then it doesn't even see it. Then this conformal zero will be uh, possible to travel through. Now, the consequence of this picture is that, as I've said already, one of the three massive right-handed neutrinos can be stable. And this picture allowed us to calculate its abundance in the universe today. And uh, what we found is that it can quite easily be the dark matter. So this picture turned out to give the simplest explanation for the dark matter in the universe. It's one of the particles we already have strong reasons to believe is there, and it's a right-handed neutrino. If it is there, it turns out there's one very important prediction, which is that one of the left-handed neutrinos must be precisely massless. And uh, you can see that from this picture I showed a while ago. You see, if this right-handed neutrino is stable, you do not want it to couple to the Higgs and left-hand because it would, it would decay. And so what you have to do is switch off the couplings of one of the three right-handed neutrinos to all the other particles. And you do that by imposing a symmetry called the Z2 symmetry. It turns out quite easy to do. You are still consistent with all the data from particle physics. 
and now the right-handed neutrino is absolutely stable. But because you switched off that coupling, then uh, you only have two coupled massive right-handed neutrinos, and it turns out that is not enough to give all three left-handed neutrinos a mass. One of them must be massless. So we predict that one of the three light neutrinos is exactly massless. And that's a prediction that's going to be checked in the next uh, 10 years. All the data is consistent with that, but it can be checked. Okay, so let's proceed. Um, what we're saying is that there is a exact symmetry between the universe we live in and the pre-universe, its uh, mirror image or anti-universe. And the way to think about this is that the Big Bang is really a mirror, that uh, there are boundary conditions at the Big Bang, which are precisely analogous to those at a mirror. You know, so if I have a mirror and I want to solve the equations for electromagnetism, uh, I could impose the boundary conditions directly on the mirror, but an easier way to do it is to make a mirror image copy of myself behind the mirror, right? And, um, and just solve the propagation of light from that mirror image to me uh, directly without any mirror being there. And so one can think of this as just a method of images. And if we uh, have this analyticity at the Big Bang, so the differential equations hold all the way through, then there is a unique uh, solution. So it, we, we've been developing this idea for the last couple of years, and we realized it's rather similar to the way Hawking imposed boundary conditions on anti de Sitter space. That's more of a mathematical problem. More physically, Roger Penrose, again, had made a conjecture called the vial curvature hypothesis. He was trying to explain what is different between the initial singularity the Big Bang, and the future singularities like the ones in black holes. And his hypothesis was that past singularities like the Big Bang have vanishing vile curvature, whereas future singularities like the one inside, ones inside black holes have divergent uh, vile curvature. And our hypothesis is absolutely consistent with that uh, picture, in fact, it's a little bit more because we're describing exactly what happens at the singularity as well. So, uh, so there are two sides of the universe. One is literally a mirror image of the other. This is a rather definite picture, but let's now translate this into the entropy. You know, can we ask which geometry of a universe with these boundary conditions is the most likely? And uh, so I think, uh, in view of time, I think I'm going to, this is a slightly technical slide about path integrals. Uh, I'm just going to sort of summarize this by saying that there, there's some rather beautiful mathematics called Pic picard uh theory, which describes how, when you have an integral, an oscillatory integral, it describes how the saddle points of that integral, these are classical solutions of the equations, just saddles, how they are, um, uh, how they're relevant to the, to the whole integral. And so there's a theorem from mathematics, it's actually only valid for finite dimensional integrals, but arbitrary dimension. The theorem says that a, uh, any relevant saddle, at any relevant saddle, this phase factor has to be less than one. The, the magnitude of it has to be less than one. So you can have a complex saddle, and then this magnitude is not uh, one, but it has to be smaller than one. And we realized this was actually inconsistent with some uh, quantum cosmology claims and, uh, and, and effectively disproved them. Now, you can also use path integrals to do statistical mechanics. And I won't go through this in detail, but just to say that the upshot is that the, you get exactly the opposite conclusion, okay? <laughs> that in statistical mechanics, if there is more than one state, the saddles have to give a positive uh, exponent. 
Um, and, and that's how you get uh, large entropies, for example, for geometrical objects. So we've applied this formalism to calculate the gravitational entropy for cosmology using the Euclidean path integral. And here's the result. So um, again, I'm not going into the technicalities, but what I'm saying is imagine I've got this universe which has radiation and lambda in it. Now, the entropy in the radiation, uh, which is basically just the temperature cubed times the volume, uh, the entropy in the radiation is, is a conserved number. Uh, it's adiabatically conserved as the universe expands. So you can think about it as a control parameter. I plotted it along this uh, bottom axis. It's convenient to plot it in units of the de Sitter entropy. This is the number I told you before was 10 to the power 122. So raised to the three quarters, it's about 10 to the 90. And that's roughly the radiation entropy we see today. So this is a number of order unity in what we see uh, today in the universe. And we, we can vary this number as a sort of control parameter of this statistical ensemble of universes. The vertical axis shows the gravitational entropy in units of that de Sitter entropy, the 10 to the 122 for today's universe. Now, we don't know what the total number of degrees of freedom are in the universe, but um, so it's an unknown parameter, just like we did not know how many atoms in the earth before we knew the size of the earth. And so this SG you should think of as analogous to the, to the number of atoms in the earth. It, it literally counts how many degrees of freedom are there in the universe. Now, something very striking happens as this entropy, total entropy in the universe increases, you can plot the effective curvature of space. This is the size of the curvature term in the Friedman equation compared to the size of the terms from the radiation and lambda densities. And you see as the total entropy in the universe grows, this uh, parameter declines. So there's a de Sitter entropy. That's what I would have if the universe was empty it's equal to one in this number. As I raise the entropy in the radiation, what I, what, I, what I find is that the universe gets flatter and flatter and flatter. The strength of the curvature goes down. Is this a surprise? Not really, you see, because we're not surprised that the gas in the room is uniformly distributed, right? It's homogeneous. That's where most of the states are. So when we look at the universe, and we find it is homogeneous and flat, are we surprised? Not really, because that's where most of the states are. Um, the fact the universe is not in equilibrium is besides the point. You're doing a statistical ensemble of possible geometries. It's amazing you can get such a clean answer out of the path integral, and this is what the answer tells you. That in a certain sense, the flatness of the, of the universe is not a surprise. It's a consequence of the fact that the universe has lots of degrees of freedom. And you don't need many more than the de Sitter entropy, you know, only bigger by a thousand, let's say, a thousand times the entropy. If the total entropy is a thousand times the de Sitter entropy, then the curvature is less than 1% of the other terms in the Einstein equation. So this omega k would be less than. 1%. Uh, 1%. So um, the total entropy is a control parameter. If the total entropy exceeds the de Sitter entropy by some factor f, then the curvature is less than f to the minus two thirds. If f is a thousand, the most probable curvature is less than 1%. And, and that's what we see. So it's like saying if I lived in the earth, you know, and I fi I'm finding it flat so far, because I only explored 100 kilometers, um, you know, what can I say about the Earth? Well, the more I explore, the more likely I am to discover the curvature. If I just keep describe, finding it's flat, all I can conclude really is that there are more atoms than I, than I thought there were. Um, and so this is a sort of astonishingly simple explanation for the flatness of the universe, 
which I think, you know, since our paper came out, uh, there's been a sort of deafening silence. Uh, uh, at least lots of people want to hear about it, but um, nobody quite knows what to make of it. Uh, it's, uh, it, it really uh, contradicts this idea that you need a mechanism to explain the flatness. Uh, I'll skip this slide. There's a sort of more intuitive way to understand why we get exactly the scaling we do, uh, uh, but I'll skip this for now. A very important point uh, which emerged from these calculations is again this issue of, of the wick rotation and Euclidean time. So for the last 50 years, people doing quantum field theory have taken Euclidean time to be fundamental. So if I draw it in this lapse picture, this N, and I take N Euclidean to be real, then they would say that real time, Lorentzian time, is rotated by pi over two compared to Euclidean time. And there's some recent papers on this by mathematicians and by Witten sort of summarizing it which essentially says, let's take Euclidean to be fundamental, and then we'll rotate to Lorentzian. We can either go this way or that way, roughly speaking, go forward in time, in real time, or backwards in real time. Now, one of the interesting things in our calculation is that this is what we argue when you're dealing with gravity, the Lorentzian has to be fundamental. So now let's look in the complex plane of the Lorentzian lapse. This is the fundamental direction. When you deal with gravity, you've got to go left. And when you deal with matter, you've got to go right. This is because gravity doesn't have thermal equilibrium in the same way that matter does. And so it's rather amusing that the mathematician's view, which excluded the left half plane, is um, directly in contradiction with this physicist's view, which you know, includes this left-hand portion dealing with gravity and matter. And basically it's saying you've got to use both wick rotations and take the Lorentzian picture as fundamental. So that's, that's very interesting. And I expect this to lead to lots of uh, debate and discussion. Um, I want to end by talking a bit about uh, this conformal symmetry, which I've mentioned that near the Big Bang, it's very important for us that the matter doesn't um, depend on the size of the universe. It doesn't, it's insensitive to that. And the way that comes about, for example, in electromagnetism, is that those parts of the standard model are invariant under local change of scale. They, they're absolutely insensitive to changing uh, the units of length uh, and even to changing it locally, to changing the units of length one way in one part of space and another way in another part of space. Many good properties follow from this, including renormalizability and so on. However, quantum corrections apparently spoil this symmetry and they lead to running couplings, quantum generated masses in QCD and so forth. We actually need this symmetry to make sense of the Big Bang. So we've been thinking a lot about this uh, sort of beautiful symmetry in the standard model that doesn't quite work because of quantum corrections, is there some way to uh, maintain it, and especially near the Big Bang? So uh, it turned out uh, that there is, uh, sorry, this slide got a little messed up. I'll come to that. Um, and it comes about by thinking of something very, very simple. I mentioned spin zero. Uh, spin zero, Higgs field. So a scalar field in uh, general relativity uh, usually has an action, well, normally has an action like this, uh, two derivatives and, uh, and uh, coordinate invariant. And then by coupling this to the curvature of space-time appropriately, you can make this invariant under uh, local rescaling. Um, of, uh, of, uh, of lengths. Now, so, so that's the normal way to introduce a scalar field. So it turns out there is another way to introduce scalar fields, and that's what we've been exploring, which is to introduce fields which have dimension zero. You see, 
these fields have dimension one, and you can read this off from the action. There are four powers of length here, two derivatives, so those are two inverse powers of length. So it follows that this H field must have dimensions of inverse length or equivalently of mass. So we call that dimension one. However, imagine that the action wasn't grad h squared, but was box phi squared. Box means grad squared. Um, this box should be inside the bracket. Um, then, uh, so imagine this is the action. So now the same argument tells you that phi is dimensionless. Uh, you've got four powers of the derivatives here and uh, four powers of the length, so they cancel. So phi is dimensionless. Such theories have been thought about in the past and generally dismissed because they were thought to be plagued by ghosts. These are uh, uh, states in the quantum theory with negative norms and, and various instabilities and so on. So this motivated us to revisit these, uh, these uh, fields just to see, could they shed any insight into this uh, breaking of uh, conformal invariance or while invariance? And it turned out they could. So when we looked at these theories, their Euclidean action is positive, it looks fine. And, and so if you're doing a Euclidean calculation, that seems uh, no unproblematic. And so we looked more carefully, calculated their partition function and found it to be absolutely fine. And this suggested that the quantum theory is healthy. It's very unusual because the vacuum in this theory is actually the only energy eigenstate. There's only one eigenstate and that's the quantum vacuum. There are no particle states at all. So very interesting and, and slightly uh, uh, paradoxical um, theory. And then we asked ourselves, okay, well, what if we threw about a few of these dimension one uh, scalars? What, what if they really were present in, in nature? There are no new particles, but maybe they somehow fundamentally alter the nature of the vacuum. So we did the following calculations and I emphasize these are all in free field theory. Okay, so really zeroth order calculations. The energy of a Fourier mode in the field. So these would, you get half h bar k, that's the normal energy in a harmonic oscillator in its ground state. The number of uh, dimension one scalars, the num these dimension zero scalars have twice as many derivatives. So not too surprising, you get a factor of two times half h bar um, k. And, uh, and then you have fermions, which have a negative contribution to the vacuum energy and gauge fields. Okay, so this is a very standard result, the contribution to the vacuum energy from all these different uh, fields. A less well-known result is the contribution to the trace of the stress tensor uh, coming from such fields. This is known as the vial anomaly. This is the, these are the terms that tell you that conformal invariance is broken by quantum corrections. And so one can go through this calculation and, vary, and all these numbers come in again. It's some combination of all of these numbers, which are integers. So then in a, a sort of miracle that we found is that if we set all of these to zero, if we ask what would it take for us to have no uh, vacuum energy at leading order, right? At a free field order, and no anomalies in conformal invariance, it turns out there's a unique solution. Given that the gauge group is SU3 cross SU2 cross U1, that fixes the number of gauge bosons to be 12. Okay, given that, it turns out all of these anomalies vanish if the number of 40 fermions is four times N1, which is 48. And that's exactly how many there are in nature. Um, and, and, and secondly, we can predict that the number of dimension zero scalars has to be uh, exactly 36. And finally, that the number of Higgs bosons has to be zero, which is ironic because I have the Higgs chair uh, in theoretical physics. Uh, so this requires exactly three generations, each containing exactly one right-handed neutrino, just what we need for the dark matter. Comments. Cancellation requires us to ignore the Higgs. That's actually okay if the Higgs is composite or emergent field. 
And there have been long been speculations along that, those lines anyway. So we have to explore that, but it's, it's perfectly uh, conceivable. Um, and, and then there's a slightly more technical comment. So now there's a bunch of papers beginning to appear exploring this idea that maybe the Higgs boson is actually a composite of these dimension zero scalars. Um, finally, I want to talk a little bit about the cosmological perturbations. This was in fact our reason for getting interested in these dimension zero fields. It turns out they have a two point function, which is log divergent. That's a direct consequence of the fact they are dimensionless, right? If you write the two-point function as an integral over k, it has to have a one over k cubed because otherwise the dimensions wouldn't work. And so this is exactly what you need to explain the scale invariant perturbations we see in cosmology. And so it turns out these fields can couple to the other matter. This coupling governs the density perturbations and actually we're just in the middle of calculating the amplitude of density perturbations we get from the, density, from the dimension zero fields, given that uh, the conformal invariance is restored in the standard model by their introduction. Okay, so uh, in view of time, I won't explain any details about this. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you a brief glimpse of the answer. It turns out that the amplitude of the density perturbations goes like the fine structure constant squared, which is about 10 to the minus four. And, uh, but we have to get all the numerical factors right. I'm hopeful that uh, we're going to be able to calculate the, this amplitude from first principles. If it agrees with the observations, you know, that will make this theory um, infinitely better than, than any theory which has uh, gone before. So we'll see how that works out. Uh, thank you very much for listening and I'm very happy to answer questions. Thank you very much. So here is how we're going to do this. Uh, we can have questions from uh, three different spaces as you call them. We'll have here the auditorium, we have Zoom and we have YouTube. Okay. Actually, we have Already a few questions on YouTube, but first I wanted to check if people had some questions here in the auditorium. If not right now, I can go to YouTube and ask some questions here. And uh, bear in mind, you, all kinds of people are watching. So, you know, some of the questions are uh, from all walks of life here. So, okay, fine. So one of them actually is, uh, I think you will enjoy answering is, uh, so, in some sense, we talk a lot about dark matter, dark energy, these kinds of things. So the question is very simple. So uh, the the viewer here is asking if um, couldn't we be tricked by misinterpreted theory or uh, over uh, overthinking some theory or over believing too much in some of the theories that we have right, right yes. now? Yes, absolutely. So you know. When I used to show that slide of all the laws of physics together, I always put a footnote to saying the one thing we cannot explain using the known physical laws is the dark matter, right? There seems to be evidence for additional matter around galaxies, which we can't explain. And I was wrong because in fact, we knew about right-handed neutrinos. Uh, I mean, no is maybe a strong word, but there is strong evidence that the, the, the mechanism of see the seesaw mechanism is easily the simplest and most elegant explanation of neutrino masses. So it's very likely that right-handed neutrinos exist. And we were shocked when we discovered that one of them can be the dark matter. I mean, it is the obvious candidate and very likely, I believe it's true. Okay. Now, the question to ask is, is why didn't anyone see this before? Why didn't anyone say that the right hand? And the reason is quite funny. You see, the way we traditionally calculate the abundances of particles in the universe, like um, the abundance of the light elements in nucleosynthesis, is by assuming thermal equilibrium. People assume there's a hot, dense plasma. The particles have a given density in that plasma. 
And then the universe expands, they fall out of equilibrium, and we get what we get coming out. These right-handed neutrinos were never in thermal equilibrium, okay? So nobody could calculate their abundance. And so they, just as a matter of convenience, assumed that they were not stable in order that they wouldn't have to calculate their abundance, because if they're unstable, they'll just go away, and so who cares? So when we uh, realized this CPT symmetric picture, it allowed us to calculate the creation of these right-handed particles during the Big Bang, and then that's where their abundance came from. So when, you know, people typically have closed off the simplest explanations by trying to work in too much of a straitjacket. Okay, not, not being open to asking bigger questions. And so I think as we attempt to answer the big questions, like what happened at the Big Bang? In the process of answering those, very likely we'll solve the other problems. And in the case of the dark matter, that may have already happened. I mean, if these experiments confirm that a right-handed neutrino is the dark matter, then the Big Bang played a role in producing the dark matter directly. The Big Bang singularity played a role in producing this dark matter. So yes, I absolutely believe we are in danger of, the whole field is in danger of having fooled itself by inventing more and more complicated models. And then we spend a long time debating all of the complexities and intricacies of those models. And we're sort of lost in their parameter space of models and they may have nothing to do with nature at all. That's why it's so important to be, you know, hyper economical um, and, and, and to be skeptical of our theories unless, until they genuinely make predictions which can be checked with uh, observations. Okay, excellent. We have another question here now on Zoom from Gustavo. Okay. Gustavo, can you turn on your mic and ask your question? Yes. Uh, so first of all, uh, Neil, thank you for your uh, very thought-provoking uh, presentation. Thank uh, you. I do uh, uh, share with you, and uh, I'm sure that lots of people, uh, your, let's call it this state for this uh, so-called uh, inflationary multiverse uh, right. uh, paradigm. So I, I am I'm glad to share that. Uh, uh, of the bat. Now I have I had one question, but now I have two questions because you sure. you talked about dark matter, um, and I'm curious um, a little bit about the details. Uh, sure. So so in this in this case you have one of the uh, right-handed neutrinos being the dark matter because you zeroed this coupling with the Higgs and the left left-handed, right? Yes. Yeah. And then yes. the question is, uh, you mentioned the abundance, uh, but how do you compute the abundance? Ah, uh, great. It doesn't couple to anything we know other than gravity. Yes. And uh, how, what fixes the abundance? This is an, uh, Lovely. I, I, you know, if it doesn't couple to anybody, how, how does it uh, come out? And then the, uh, the other question, yes. uh, it's more about the cosmology. I'm not a cosmologist, but uh, it seems that your, um, the evolution of your scale parameter uh, is not, it, it's different from what uh, typically uh, the uh, lambda CDM model uh, prescribes. And no, so, uh, it's exactly the same. It's exactly the same, so you answer the question. So there's no, and so the question really I have, which is, I couldn't really see, is yes. what really goes, what really determines the calculation of your entropy, which is right. so important in, the, in determining the flatness. I thought it was some sort of non-standard no. uh, solution, no. but if it's not, I didn't understand then, what determines the yes, beautiful solution uh, of the the, uh, you know, the entropy being so big. Right. And that so that's, okay. that's great. my question. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you for the questions. Uh, now I'm just going to answer your first question by showing a couple more slides. Um, so a heavy right-handed neutrino is the dark matter. It is the obvious candidate. It always has been since the 1970s. But uh, as I mentioned, you know, you can make it stable by imposing a Z2 symmetry. 
so it's rather simple to exclude this coupling that would allow it to decay. They, they were never in thermal equilibrium. And so previously people just ignored them, okay? Because they didn't know how to calculate the abundance. So what we did is instead we have this doubled picture. And so we, we have two asymptotic regions, you know, the, the, the far past before the Big Bang and the far future in the, on these two sides of the Big Bang. And we impose CPT symmetry. We say the universe is CPT symmetric. So we choose a quantum state, quantum vacuum state for the um, right-handed neutrino, which is CPT symmetric. And so uh, here it is. So there's an adiabatic vacuum going in and there's an adiabatic vacuum going out. And the CPT invariant vacuum is just the linear combination of the two. So you, you, you take that, you see, if I send in a particle, this is how, this is essentially how Hawking radiation or um, production of particles in a time dependent background, this is how it works. You start from a state which is in, in some assumed va vacuum and you propagate it forward and you see after some time dependent evolution, you know, what state am I in? And so the in vacuum is not empty in the out for the out observer and vice versa. And so literally that's all we did is we constructed the linear combination of in and out. And we asked how many particles are there in this vacuum for the out observer? And this is the answer that the number of particles of mass M go like the mass to mass of the Planck mass to the three halves power times the temperature cubed. The temperature comes in because it's just the radiation density which governs the evolution of the metric, the space-time metric. So it's as simple as that. It's a perfectly finite calculation. And then you take the abundance of these massive particles and you, you equate it, you know, that number density times their mass is the density in dark matter. And when you do that, you find their mass. And so it's 4.8 times 10 to the 8 GV. And uh, as I mentioned, its stability implies one of the three light neutrinos is massless. And that prediction, as, as this is just the production, you, you, you solve the mode equations going in and coming out. And uh, uh, the, the, the wonderful thing is that experiments like this one, the Vera Rubin Observatory, are going to measure the sum of all the light neutrino masses to an accuracy of about 12 MeV. Now, if the lightest one is massless, then from the mass differences we already know, the sum will be 60 MeV in the normal hierarchy or 100 MeV in the inverted hierarchy. So because we are predicting the mass of the lightest ones, we actually predict this, these, these two numbers. And so when they measure the total masses of the neutrinos, if it turns out to be consistent with 60, then you know, that, that is a, a big success of our, uh, because 60 comes about only if the lightest one is massless. The, these are, so currently this is what's known. The mass differences are known, but the absolute masses are not known. So we're just saying that the lightest one is actually at zero. And that's allowed by current data. And within 10 years, we should be able to uh, constrain that uh, quite precisely. I mean, to five sigma or, or better. So, uh, so yeah, it, it, it should be, uh, I mean, this will be a big success for this theory if, uh, if it turns out to be true. All right. Uh, now the second question, yes. Yep. So how the hell did we get the entropy? <laughs> okay. So the way you get it is, surprisingly simple. Ask yourself, how did Hawking calculate the entropy of a black hole? So he started with the metric. Let's take a short shell black hole. You, you start with the short shell metric. You analytically continue it to imaginary time. It becomes a Euclidean metric of some sort, which solves the Euclidean Einstein equations. And then you uh, essentially calculate the action 
the Einstein action, just integral of R, you've got to do it very carefully because they're boundary terms and so on. But you calculate that action of the Euclidean metric, and that is the, uh, actually minus the Euclidean action, is the entropy of the black hole. It's a very formal calculation, but all it uses are the Einstein equations and the Einstein action. That's it. What we do is exactly the same. We know, we assume Einstein gravity, we assume a cosmological constant and radiation. And then we write down the action. It's absolutely the conventional action for those three terms. We solve the uh, classical equations. We continue them to Euclidean time. Okay, so time is rotated Euclidean. That's where the subtleties about wick rotation come in. You've got to do it in the right way. It turns out you must rotate the radiation one way and the gravity the other way. But so that uh, so, so that's all we do. And then we calculate this Euclidean action that gives us the entropy. So it's, it's an extremely clean calculation. That doesn't mean it's right, okay? Because conceptually it's doing something very amazing. What it is doing is it's counting the number of space times corresponding to those parameters in the theory. So in the case of a black hole, the only parameter you have is its mass. And, you can, and so you impose that as an asymptotic boundary condition, its mass. And then you compute the entropy in this Euclidean method. In our case, we have no asymptotic uh, region. The only parameters we have are the lambda, the total entropy in the radiation, um, and, um, and then we have the curvature of space. And we calculate these Euclidean instantons as a function of those parameters. And we ass simply assert, I would say, that this is the gravitational entropy, okay? Now, what I want to do is to do a, a more satisfactory, you know, this is what we have to do still, is to construct a statistical ensemble of which this is the entropy. <laughs> and that ensemble, we know roughly what it should look like. It should be an ensemble of space times and, um, and the ensemble should be quantized and we, we should be able to count the number of space times. Now that is going to be very difficult in 4D gravity, right? We, we just don't know enough about how to do these calculations. However, it turns out there's a perfect toy model, which funnily enough is string theory itself. You see string theory is a theory of a two dimensional manifold, one plus one. You can put a string in a background like ADS or background fields, and then you can uh, count states. You can literally count states. So it is a quantum geometry of a one plus one dimensional universe. And we recently, I didn't mention in this talk, but we recently realized that our conformal zero, you know, the space time with the big bang and the conformal zero, almost all of its properties are exactly mimicked in a string theory of, uh, which has a one, one plus one dimensional um, string evolving in anti de Sitter space with a three form gauge field. It's, uh, it's called the SL2R Wesumino Witten model. Uh, so it turns out, and, and my feeling is that string theory is gonna turn out to be really useful as a toy laboratory where the two dimensions of the string are, uh, you know, proxy for real four-dimensional gravity. Very similar principles hold, you know, in string theory, you have to have conformal invariance. It's got to be correct at the quantum level. You use the dilaton to cancel some anomalies in the, uh, in the, um, in the quantum Verisoro algebra. In, in fact, in just the same way, we use the dimension zero fields to cancel the trace anomalies in 4D. So there are all kinds of parallels. And I think string theory is the ideal toy laboratory to look at uh, realistic gravity. And so I'm hoping that we're going to be able to construct a detailed statistical ensemble where we can actually count the states, the number of uh, distinct you know, string space times and, and verify that this is this Euclidean calculation, which is very formal, um, actually is, 
calculating what we wanted to calculate. Uh, that, that remains to be done. But I would say, yeah, look at the paper, you'll find there is very little arbitrary in that paper. We've only assumed Einstein gravity and we're absolutely conventional about almost everything. Uh, the only thing is that we're, we're, as I say, following Hawking and others in asserting that the Euclidean action measures the gravitational entropy. Very, very good. Very interesting. Uh, I'm, uh, I certainly will look at the, at the paper. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, actually, we are running really late. Uh, oh, sorry. I, I have to say that I, I wish I could stay also here and ask you lots of questions, just looking at, just um, see what you have presented to us here, right? Raises all kinds of, you know, curiosities. And we had many other questions there, but I'm really afraid that we are uh, running out of time. Uh, okay. It's interesting yeah. that you, you finish in a sense, you know, some of the stories that we've been hearing for, you know, the last several years was that, you know, string theory was a true underlying theory and everything else was a toy model for this. And now, <laughs> and now it makes sense. string theory is a toy model for everything else. So that's uh, turning things on its head in a funny way. Yes. So, yes. Neil, thanks again for this uh, wonderful talk. And uh, thank you so much. All thank uh, our speaker again. Thank you. And that's it. So thank you we, very much. Hopefully we can see you here at some point in the future. Absolutely. After all this is done. Neil, uh, thank you so thank much for thank you. Thank you, Raul, for, for this talk. And it was wonderful to have you here. Thank you for organizing everything. Really appreciate okay. it. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Muito bem, pessoal. Obrigado pela presença de todos. E até mais.